Okay, we're going to call this meeting to order at 6.04 and yep. request a roll call, please, Pam. Absolutely. Ryan Slack. Here. Jennifer Riffle. Present. Gary Tenenbaum. Here. Bill Infante. Here. Auden Schindler. Here. Katie Schwer. Here. And Jackie Whitson. Here. <clears throat> wow, the A-team is present. I do not have my cheat sheet, but I know that it's Ryan running the show for Grassroots. We want to thank Ryan for being here. Uh, and for recording this, you can watch it live or later at www.grassroots.org. Um, also, tomorrow at the Mayor's Coffee, I spoke with Kathy Chandler Henry, the um, Eagle County Commissioner, and she is also going to be at CC's tomorrow. Possibly Brian Mahoney, sometimes the Chief is there, so please come over if you want to. Um, I also see that there is a um, Community celebration, this is a long time off, but I guess I'll say it anyway. July 3rd, the Basalt Heritage Society. Uh, looks like it's just a community celebration, but there are free hot dogs, so that's important. And I'll probably say that again before July 3rd comes. Okay, did I miss anything, Pammy? Okay. Our first agenda item is the consent agenda. Uh, are there any questions? Does anybody want to pull anything off, or is there a motion to approve? Mayor, I move that the Town Council approve the consent agenda items as presented. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? I'm abstaining. Okie doke, do you want to say why? or? Because the uh, ski code thing is on there. Oh, gotcha. Thank you, Auden. Um, the next item is comments from the public for items that are not on the agenda this evening. Um, three minutes, please. Hi, I'm Carol Hawk. I live in Willits. Hi, I'm a community member on the Eel County Mental Health Advisory Committee, and I've been trying to get some press over here as to what they've been doing with the marijuana tax. It hasn't happened yet, but I'm hoping it's going to, so I thought I'd just give you a little update. Um, at the beginning of um, the marijuana tax, the Eel County Commissioners committed half a million dollars to put school-based mental health counselors in our high schools. So the Salt High School got one last year. Um, Things, other things that have been um, funded to date, um, they're actually bringing the Hope Center over to the Vale Valley, which is pretty excited. They're really excited about having what we have here now over there. Um, they've also brought bilingual therapists to Valley Settlement here in Elder Bell. And let's see what else. And we've got the Buddy Program also received some funding. Um, Mine Springs got some money, which affects both sides of the valley, the whole mountain area, as well as jail-based counselors in the Eel County Jail. And at our last meeting last week, we actually um, tabled a few things, but we did move forward with funding a full-time um, mental health counselor for Basalt Middle School next year. So I just want to give you the update. Great. Nice, that's awesome. Thanks, Carol. Yeah, it's all that good is stuff. Great. Thank you. Oh, and I, f I, f I forgot to ask for the formal reading of the introduction by Jennifer Riffle, please. Can I, can I add a line to it? Basalt is an inclusive, sustainable <laughs> mountain community that boasts both historic charm and progressive vision. It is an engaging place to live, work, and play while offering an abundance of creative, professional, educational, and recreational outlets, whereas a majority of people drive down the middle of the street. <laughs> I like that. It's just an interesting one. People tend to not view or stay within the lanes. I would be one of those. Yeah. Um, was there anybody else that wanted to in make comments yeah. that for items that are not on the agenda? Yeah. Hi, Michael Hi. Kerr here. Um, so CPW concluded their uh, committee meeting uh, a few days ago, and I just wanted to comment a couple things about it. Now that that dog and pony show is, at least that part of it's over. Um, CPW is up to what they always do. The propaganda, lies, and misrepresentation. Let's be clear about this. In the minutes of 2010 uh, meetings of the committees for the shooting range, uh, CPW confirmed that there were cameras, operational cameras at the range. Um, I've got a copy of an email that uh, from Perry Will, and we all know, there are no uh, cameras, operational cameras. So they lied to the committee and the town and, and pretty much everybody that they had 
done certain things up there. So just want to be clear about where they're coming from. They will continue to do that. In my mind, they're not a friend at all. They're, in fact, an enemy. And the other thing is that we're actually putting town funds to fund the operation of that range. I think it's, I think it's criminal, absolutely criminal. To, and they treat us like they treat us. And we give them money to help them. I mean, come on. So anyways, I'm going to read an email from Mike Luciano. He couldn't be here. Uh, CPW has con concluded the range will be open. The debate is over. Any concerns local officials may have had regarding the perception of taking sides or personal bias has been eliminated. Now the residents of the affected area are in desperate need for, for our town leaders to implore CPW to become a good neighbor. Well, and uh, actions speak louder than words. CPW actions to increase hours of operation by 18 hours over the weekend in the summer speaks volumes. Despite their claims of trying to be sensitive to local residents' concern about noise, their actions <coughs> say the exact opposite. Residents of the affected area are asking for reasonable compromise of hours of operation. We need our town to insist on hours not be increased and a dialogue between the affected residents, town officials, and CPW is established ASAP. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Chris, did you have something? Hi, Chris Matera with Salt Chamber of Commerce. I just wanted to provide council with several updates and I can go into greater detail at a later date, but it's public comment and I've got three minutes. Uh, so our Basalt Summer Concert Series, which is uh, in partnership with the Town of Basalt, kicks off next week on uh, June 19th. Uh, everything is listed on our brand new website which is one of our announcements. Um, so it kicks off with Dirty Revival and Triangle Park and Willits, and KDNK will actually be doing a live broadcast of the event. Um, they will be a second one at the end of the series. With and what, what, what date is that? That is next Wednesday, the 19th. You will hear me on air promoting it starting next week. Um, so we're very excited about it. We will have three concerts in Willits and four concerts here in downtown. Uh, and it's quite the lineup. We are doing it in partnership with Taka, so they are producing partners, and they have gotten us a great set of bands for that. So it's very exciting, and from people who are music enthusiasts have heard it's probably the best lineup in the Valley this summer. Wow. So we beat out oh. Snowmass on that one in Glenwood. You can repeat that if you want your <laughs> <laughs> Best music here in Basalt. Right here. Um, so the runs through August 14th, will, which will end with the annual Starwood uh, reunion concert. And we will have one variation of our standard Wednesday night series. And that will be a street dance party on Market Street, which was in the consent agenda, on July 12th. Um, and that will be a awesome reggae band out of Telluride. So that's exciting. Uh, other events coming up uh, on July 20th, we will have a revival of an event started by a town councilman, Pete McBride. Basalsa will be coming back. Um, so we're working very hard on bringing that event here to Midland Spur. Um, <coughs> we saw the success that happened with Coco, particularly with the fire and how diverse of a community came out that night to watch the movie and we wanted to build upon that. So we're bringing Basalsa back. Also, uh, we have National Night Out coming up on August 6th, and we'll be partnering with Basalt Police and a fire on that as well. And finally, a couple of Office of Economic Development updates with our two Blueprint 2.0 grants that we received. Um, the branding grant is in its final stages. We're working with the marketing and communications team at OEdit to do a new logo design. And we've reached out to various members of the community on some feedback on that. Hopefully we'll get our first round um, next week. Our co-working grant is pretty much wrapped up at this point. Um, and actually, oh, edit seeing the focus on the brain capital we have here on the Western Slope. So the first ever w a West Slope startup week happened last week in Grand Junction. And it was really well attended. And I swear, like, there was no one left in the Roaring Fork Valley tied to entrepreneurship. They were all in Junction last week. Um, and along those lines, as we're satisfying that co-working grant, we have signed a lease on a new office space that will be part chamber office and part co-working space so that we can help support our small businesses. Okay. 
Sorry. I'm out of time, but finish we're, your sentence. <laughs> we saw a lot of the feedback with the master plan um, listening sessions, and we see the section under work, particularly small business support, and we want to partner with the town and the county and the state to make sure that that is happening here in Basalt. When will you be in your new space? We're working on that, but hopefully a soft, swag. Just soft, swag it. Eh, month. We got internet and phones installed finally, so we're getting there. We do have meetings there occasionally. Excellent. So nice I should be space. moving in as soon as I can get my stuff over there. <clears throat> hey, Thank Chris, you. Chris, you sent an email uh, saying, do you like this one, this one, or this one? <laughs> and I responded late. Is that process for the mm -hmm. whatever it is, motto, town yeah. motto, that's done? That we have the tagline, um, oh, edit will be coming down to do a big community reveal okay. for that. So but we have the tagline, the next step's the logo, and move forward from there. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And if I can comment briefly, Chris sent over a number of logos that were from a bunch of different places where they're asking uh, different folks to comment on the logos, the color, the style, um, things of that nature. And so I just this afternoon started looking at it um, and making some comments, so I'll circulate that they want it back pretty quickly probably I, I said by the end of the week i know they probably want it sooner than that um uh so uh i'll try to get it out uh, perhaps tomorrow um to you all um, so you can kind of see what the comments are and if you have anything else to add by all means okay no just for curiosity's sake are these town logos or are these chamber logos uh do you want it, it's not specifically a town logo the way, the way we've logo. clarified it with the Office of Economic Development is we are looking for, uh, the, the goal of the logo is to be more tourism and economic development focused. So the way I've explained it to them is Aspen has the Defy Ordinary that their chamber has taken on, but they are also a chamber of resort association. Um, so there would be an overarching basalt brand with a new tagline that would be used more externally focused, but hopefully install some sense of local pride. There would still be the municipal logo potentially, or if you guys like it, you can adopt it. And then the chamber would be using that to influence our future logo because our current logo only represents a portion of our membership and a portion of this town. So look in big picture. <laughs> Anybody else have questions for Chris since we got her? Great. You can come back and please do. Every time we have a meeting, we want you here. Um, I don't want to... Um, blindside you chief but I've been seeing some good posts on Facebook about upcoming flooding and things like that do you have anything you want to say on nationwide television while you have the opportunity <laughs> no so there's been a, a big uh, concerted effort to get as much information as we can out on social media pages so police department town uh, fire departments police departments Pickens County Emergency Management, Eagle County Emergency Management is all pushing the exact same information so it's consistent. And so people have um, information that if they, if they have a question about how to build a go kit or how to shelter in place, you can go to the social media pages and, and there's a lot of information and then updated information on uh, possible debris flows, mud and flood, flooding in the rivers is being pushed out through the IMT, the incident management team that we stood up earlier this spring. Um, so that's that's kind of what you're seeing and if anyone has questions feel free to contact any of the agencies that are doing this and if if, if they live uh, like an example last night we had the the gathering for the late Christine Burnscar and there was a lot of Garfield County residents that attended that one with questions so if if we don't know the answer we can get you in contact with a representative of an agency or, or organization that does have that answer great thank you so much you okay um, <clears throat> Mayor and Council reports and comments. I think we have other citizens. Yeah. Oh, do it. come on up. Come on up. Thank you. Good catch. Um, I can't be here for the next meeting, so I wanted to just re-complain again. That's fine. About the, uh, <laughs> uh, my name's John Locke. I live across from the proposed dormitory of Skiko's proposed dormitory. And there's only really three things that, that I just want to mention tonight. And is the dormitory, the deed restrictions, 
<coughs> um, parking. And the dormitory, what more can I say about it? You're either, if you, you're either for it or against it. If you live close to it like I do, you're against it because um, I went to college in a dormitory. I know what goes on in those things. And uh, I know the noise that goes with it and so on. But uh, people that don't live there that are going to vote on this, um, you know, it's uh, not going to mean much to this. But deed restrictions are something that I would like to know a little bit more about. And I would think that the board there, the council would too. Um, one of the second meeting that they had about this, I met two young ladies that were uh, health care workers. And they were really excited about this building going in. They were going to have first choice on these. They were health care workers. And they thought that was great. And it sounded great. So I talked to them a little bit afterwards. And they said, uh, and I said, man, that does sound good for you. I said, now what is the rate cap going to be? And she said, oh, we don't know. And I said, well, haven't you? Yeah, we've asked them, but they won't tell us. And well, what good's a rate cap? Uh, what's good having first choice? What's a good, good is it going to do those young ladies to have first choice if they don't know what the rate cap is going to be, what the deed restriction would be on that? And uh, they said, well, uh, Skiko wouldn't tell them. They said they'd tell them when that was uh, after it had been passed. And so uh, that's like uh, you know saying I have I have first choice to buy a Rolls Royce. That's not going to help me. I can't buy a Rolls Royce. And and if that deed, if that uh, rent cap is top, is capped so high for them, that they can't afford it. Well, that doesn't being first choice, having first choice to get them, doesn't mean anything. And. Uh, I noticed the last time there was actually a vote on uh, on that. It didn't. It was two and two, and I guess it went by the wayside, and it's going to be voted on later on. But does the board know what the deed restrictions are, and how can you vote on? I think anybody here, if I buy a house, I want to know what the deed restrictions are. And I don't know. Does anybody here know what the deed restrictions are before you vote for this? Vote for this in. And from what I understood, I researched it and tried to find out a little bit that no, SKIKO's going to set those uh, uh, deed restrictions, but it's going to be after it's approved. That's kind of like buying a pig in a poke, isn't it? You know, you don't know what you're getting. You're voting it in, but you don't know what the deed restrictions are, so you have no, no who knows? And then the last thing, because it's such a short time, is the parking. And uh, they say that uh, you know they just can't possibly afford to have underground parking. So I went over to uh, 10101 and over just across the street from this, where this is going to be built, and uh, got their brochure. They have underground parking, by the way. They're not going to get uh, as much per square foot for their housing as uh, as Skiko is going to get, but. For some reason, they can afford underground parking, and um, I, if they can, I don't know why Skiko can't afford to put underground parking there. And then the other thing I'd like to mention on the parking was, you know, the proposal that they gave to us. Parking is already, for us residents of the Willits there, parking is already a problem. And to, for us, to, they proposed that Willits or the town of Basalt sell us, sell them some of our parking spots. <laughs> that just seems absurd <laughs> to aggravate a, a situation that's already uh, not very tenable. But um, that was all I had to say this time. I can't be here for the other time. And there's a, quite a few people out there that feel the same way I do. They, that I think most of them just thrown up their hands and said, well, they're just going to, that the board is just going to, council just cave to Kioskiko anyway, no matter what. And, uh, but I sure don't think you ought to prove something if you don't know what the deed restrictions are. You, none of you here would buy a house without knowing what the deed restrictions are. I certainly wouldn't. So that's Thank you. all. Thank you. Okay, is there anybody else I missed that wants <clears throat> to speak? Okay, hearing none. Now, council and mayor reports and comments. Anybody? Hi, Katie. Yes, ma'am. I'd like to hand out a staff MVP award <coughs> to Watkins Folk Gray. 
first of all, for winning the Basalt Half Marathon. Winning. Yes, the what? men's division. Congratulations. <laughs> and <laughs> oh, get ready for another round of applause. The icing on the cake is he translated the entire uh, uh, master plan survey into Spanish. And that is quite an accomplishment. And, yes. and, yes. and, the, and the entire website. So is, recognize is that, you. Is that all? <laughs> And that, what else can you add to it, Watkins? You every day. Yeah. <laughs> and he has a great attendance record. <laughs> <laughs> and he's getting his eyes fixed soon. <clears throat> Thank you very much. I know you've been doing, I've seen you in the building official's office too, wearing that hat for quite a while till we got somebody in there. So you're this, this strong, silent type. Apparently, somebody has to say how great you are, though. So thank, thank you so much. Well, nobody could beat that one, but go ahead and try if you want. <laughs> and I don't, I don't have anything. Yes, Bill. I just had a question um, to follow up on Mike's comments. And I had in, intended to ask about kind of any updates that we might receive from CPW and kind of the conclusions. Because reading about them in the paper the other day, I was actually a little bit surprised that they've kind of adopted a seven day, 12 hours a day policy when that was part of what we had asked very specifically that they curtail. It did look like they, they came a long distance in a number of other regards, however. So I, I want to salute them on agreeing to place an officer there, which it sounds like they're going to finance, but I'd like to confirm that. And then also some of the other safeguards, the <coughs> cameras and other things. I think we do want to you know, just make sure that we know what is what the outcome will be. But one thing I didn't see was any comment on the lead survey that a number of citizens had had requested in the early stages of our conversations on the, um, the gun range. And so curious what we're going to do with that. Ryan, you and I had spoken about the water quality monitoring that we do do independently. Mm -hmm. And so that may satisfy the request for a lead survey, but if it does, I'd simply like to publicize that so we can, at least in good faith, um, present to our community that we are conscious that lead is an issue, but based on our, our existing water quality monitoring, we don't see any evidence of lead in ground or surface water, you know, something like that. Yeah. Um, so I came prepared because I figured after that meeting this was the first time that we would be able to speak and I could get any direction from the council on commenting um, on the on the meeting. Um, so to start with, um, in case anybody uh, here um, has not uh, seen it, the um, presentation, the PowerPoint they did that night, I got a copy and we put it up on our website. Um, so for sake of the public to watching, if they would like to to look at that, um, that's a good place to kind of see everything consolidated. Um, Where but on our website is it? Front and center, right, uh, right, right, right there. Yeah, can't miss it. Yeah, sure. Um, and uh, Bill, as it relates to your uh, question on the um, the environmental assessment, they did uh, have that in here, and there was a if I can find it briefly, environmental assessment. So flood concerns um, uh, ch ch flows directly through the range. They did not. They did not mention in the PowerPoint. Um, oh, soils, soils testing. testing. So there it is. And then their their that's under their long term, but it, it <coughs> that's a little bit of a misnomer. I believe they had um, 19 and 20 on there that they would be uh, working on 2019 uh, later in the year that they would be working on that environmental assessment. So okay. so that's that sounds like it's forthcoming. Um, as it relates to the funding, it does appear that they've received funding for the, the range officers and such. You know, they did, uh, you know, we, we put $5,000 in our budget for this year to help with- 50. 5,000 for range officer specifically. Um, there is also $50,000 in there for other improvements so to help with some of the short-term improvements. Um, and so that $5,000, you know, they would they would ask for that as part of the range officer program, but the cost is gonna far exceed $5,000. Um, 
and uh, you know they do plan in the short term on putting up uh, some of the cameras and uh, doing some of the fire mitigation, creating a, a ring of of uh, you know uh, a green space around, um, and <clears throat> I think that the uh, the time like the the operating hours uh, they did come with um, three different sort of seasons. You know, the winter season is where they had the most reduced hours, right. but the summer season was the was the highest use. Yeah. Um, which was seven days a week and you know I think from from our standpoint um, prior when we adopted the resolution um, you know we had asked for reduced hours um, which they complied with um, come to find out um, some of the confusion is I guess they have existing contracts with private purveyors that can take people up there to shoot and those contracts allow them to shoot seven days a week um, the same goes for the the, the the gun club the sportsman's club and um, and so you know I think those um, these are keep in mind proposals from the citizen committee that then have to go um, through either local or the, their local folks if they have the authority to implement things or to the to the regional to the commission okay. ultimately to chew on so you know I think there's there's not a um, a lost opportunity for council to um, deliver, you know, their thoughts mm -hmm. on on the range and, and sort of what what the short and long term uh, uh, suggestions were. So, mm -hmm. um, but you know, either we could um, talk about that tonight, or you know, I could we could bring it back, or you if you if you all had a chance to review um, the, the PowerPoint and had some comments. We did have a couple counselors there, so if you have any comments um, to add. I would love to hear from Jen and Katie since they were there. Yeah. Sure. Um, so one thing that I wanna put out there to all citizens and to us counselors, if you do want to make uh, comments directly to CPW, they do have a survey uh, that is available online through uh, June 20th. They will then close the survey. But this is where you do directly submit your comments um, that will go to the commission. Okay, and can I stop you right there? Yeah. Is it possible to link that to the town get website? To get it to me and I'll yeah. get it out. Okay. Yeah. And, I'll give the address right now. And also maybe um, on the town Facebook page just to let it be a little bit more broadly known because that's a pretty short time frame and I don't know how anyone would know. Yeah. So if you want to do it right now, Go to cpw.state.co.us, search shooting ranges, and under shooting ranges, there's a survey available to provide comments. Maybe we can find that link and just send that would be back. Great. Yeah. That's I, would, I would potentially, yeah. I would ask CPW to extend that deadline because, I mean, I never even heard about a survey. No. Right. I mean, it's, it's really not fair. I know. If you put it out there, it'll be loaded up by a ton of out of people, but it would be great if they had some demographic information on that survey so you can see where people are commenting from and and really put it out there so, you know, people can actually, because I never heard of it and I never heard, talked to anyone about there's a survey there. Good idea. Yeah. Thanks, Jim. And then some interesting citizens uh, questions. So after you you can read the the um, presentation, the PowerPoint. Uh, but it, what I found were interesting were the citizen questions and then um, the uh, citizen committee responses, along with Matt Yamashita, who's our local CPW ranger, and then his supervisor. I blanked what his name is. Or him because right. I didn't know him. But it wasn't a speaking questions. You had to write your questions down and then they would answer them. And so some of the questions were, has there been a consideration for charging a fee for day use? Um, that they said they responded, CPW responded, that that was not um, beyond a, a hard ask, um, <coughs> that there are other ranges where they do charge um, a fee, but there was concern um, that a fee may turn people away and they may go shoot in the forest. 
Um, another response was, um, what about consistent rules between all the CPW sites? And CPW <coughs> responded, it, each of them is a different animal, so we can't have the same rules across the board. Um, but what did occur at the basalt shooting range is greatly influencing all of their um, locations. Um, as well, the regional manager will rule on the schedule of when the shooting range is open. So know that your comment should be to the regional man manager for that. Um, the commission drives the, the citizen task suggestions and the updates would s start to be considered in December of 20, 20, this year, 2019. And they will meet three times and this um, general commission, it's like the larger, the Colorado State <coughs> CPW Commission, they will then decide on what the suggestions were. And on that, can we find out the meeting that they will? Right. Because one of the best ways to actually influence the Colorado Wildlife Commission sure. is to actually go to their meetings. Yeah. Because our local representative, Eden, had a long conversation with him and he goes, you'd be amazed at how few people show up, but every, interest group shows up so honestly that's a big deal and i know the next one's july 18th in telluride but uh so anyway well, if that's going to be on that agenda we could rent a raft of bus right well if it, it's going to be on the agenda it would be great to get information out there in case people were concerned enough that they wanted to go there to voice their concern <coughs> Great. Thanks, Gary. Sorry to chime in. Oh, but. no, that's great. Um, and then there was a question, is there, um, this was my question um, that they answered, is there consistency within fire restrictions? Um, if our local fire department design, designates that it's a stage one or stage two, will the shooting range <coughs> um, shut down or will there be, and so their response was, we will have more communication and that there will be better communication between um, the town manager, Matt Yamashita, and the fire department. They're going to strive for that, but there is no rules or they don't have to follow any sort of protocol for that. Um, and then another question that I asked, um, they designated that there were two or three, there were three possible um, relocation sites and they're all old gravel pits. And they said, but it was cost prohibitive. Um, and I asked, well, what's the cost? And so, uh, the cost of an indoor range is $8 million plus maintenance. And then the site, so that would be if it were on the site here. And then if they were to uh, purchase another location, a gravel pit, one of the bits, or one of, just in conversations, uh, it was between 8 and $9 million just to get the land. And that's not to develop the shooting range. And then the added cost on top of that would then be to, um, reclaim the basalt site and that would be another three to six million dollars in um, getting it back to environmental huh. yeah that seems way high if, if. Mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> that is true um, yeah, i do this all the time that's an enormous number and the range safety officers will not be there um they're going to start in july of each year and that was one of my comments is um our our drought season can start in June. Um, we were in stage one fire restrictions June of last year, and so I feel strongly that there should be a range safety officer. Um, and then they said that they do have funding. Um, it's promising for long-term supervision and video, um, that they do have that within their own budget. And that's that was. That was it. Very good reporting, Jennifer. Thank you. Really good. Do you have anything to add? Sure. I'll just mention the things that really jumped out um, to me. There were some really positive things, like Jen was mentioning, the, the um, having someone on site um, and some other things. But the non-ideal things that jumped out at me are the extended hours. 12 hours a day, seven days a week is pretty excessive. Um, the other thing was they're working on signs so that people are clear about what they can and cannot do up there. But for some bureaucratic reason, the signs cannot be placed until 2020, mm -hmm. which just is absolutely stunning that we can't inform people 
what they can and cannot do at the site. So somehow expediting that um, needs to happen. Um, the other thing that really jumped out at me is that there's contemplation of creating a world-class gun range up there, making it a destination. As a resident, I don't feel comfortable augmenting and creating a destination where instead of having 10,000 visits, we could have 50,000 visits. Um, so that, that was something that really jumped out at me was, um, I thought we're trying to rein this in, not massively expand the use of this gun range. Um, so waiting until December, I mean, I know this is a bureaucratic process. It's just such a lengthy process to make any um, real progress on some of these items. But with the extended hours, I'm assuming they're starting them ASAP. Does that, is that your understanding, or are they going to keep... I don't know. I, I wasn't okay. clear on that. Okay. It's just... I only picked up that they were going to have the range safety officer start in July because yeah. their budget is their a June to June. Yeah. Um, and so they don't have the funds right now. Um, so no, that wasn't, there was no concrete. Um, this is probably an aside from that meeting, but is was Eagle County there and are they participating financially well, in this? <coughs> so are they matching like uh, our funds or anybody's funds since this is in the county? I'm not sure. Uh, Eagle County, the, the, the under sheriff was there um, I don't recall. Did you see any other staff? I didn't see. I, I don't remember seeing other staff there. Well, maybe we, the town, could just uh, follow up on that and see, just point blank, maybe in writing even, can you help with the funding of some of these things? Because it might help move it up, some of these things. Cause, I, I mean, mean, the <clears throat> signs should happen now. Like order it. The, the yeah. temporary signs. Yeah, you could probably do yeah, some exactly. temporary signs, and I think the range manager will help with, you know, overseeing that. My understanding is they have a contract mm -hmm. with a sign company, and they, ha they, they have to use that sign company, and they put in their order, and they only get them once a year. It must be a budgetary thing, too, so I mean, I picked up on that bureaucratic um, sort of process as well. And the language the had to be approved by the commission. Yes. They had a right. sign committee. and. Yeah. So we can find out more. But. Yeah. Anything else, Katie? No, those were the, like, the big ones that really jumped out. Anything at me. council wants to <clears throat> include in this, send forward messages to anybody? Yeah, I mean, I think we should offer comments now on this, you know, latest iteration. Mm -hmm. To me, um, you know, we had the whole winter to think about this. We expressed the desire to pursue relocation to say, oh, it's too expensive, I don't buy it. I think there should be an ongoing and maybe permanent effort to relocate it, because if, if we don't do it, the next council is gonna have to. It's, it's, in, it's pretty close to town. So I, I support the range, it's good to have it there. I know tons of friends of mine use it, but let's keep looking, one. And two, okay, if it's $8 million for an indoor range and that's the only option, let's start fundraising. You know, that's not an insurmountable cost for a world-class range that would eliminate fire danger, eliminate sound. Um, so let's not be, you know, deterred by that number. So I would like for us to come to some consensus comments and share them. I think we could also have comments on hours of operation um, because that seems, it seems almost like now it's back, you know, back open. If their contracts are the reason why could you close it before? Right. So again, I, I think we can keep being progressive on this. I have another comment semi tied to this, which is Lake Christine adjacent to this is both, as I've said before, this incredible asset for the community. You can go there with your kid and catch little sunfish and their bass in there, but it's a pit. It's covered in thistle. Um, and I know part of this is that the dam doesn't work, and, um, but as we've discussed before, I'd love to see us start looking, helping them, you know, figuring out how to improve that area. It could be beautiful. It's amazing. Um, and 
you know, while you're there, you hear the, the shooting constantly. So an indoor range would help mitigate that. Um, if the cost of land is too much, that might be the place to do it. So I, I said, let's not stop, let's keep going. And we're also getting comments from citizens about noise and uh, concern there. So that this should be an ongoing issue for us. Can I make one more yeah, quick sure. comment? Just to clarify, the indoor shooting range would only be for <coughs> rifles and handguns, mm -hmm. and that they would continue to have an outdoor <coughs> skeet shooting. And so, and skeet is one third of what occurs, so the sound would reduce by two thirds, but there still would be. But that's a separate deal anyway, right? That we can't necessarily control that skeet, private skeet range. So, well, following up on what Auden is saying, Ryan. It's public, but they have a private club. Right, yeah. it's a private club. It's public, it's on public land. Right, so right. Ryan. Well, and, and, and again, sorry, Jackie, <laughs> we don't control any of this. No. Of course. But it, what I'm hearing is it, it seems like it might be a good idea for <coughs> you to take these comments, concerns, et cetera, and maybe put together a bulleted list of our concerns so that we can send them to them formally mm -hmm. in, like Auden says, in consensus mm -hmm. and make, you know, let's get the meeting date on our calendars and, you know, Mm -hmm. See how many people we can get. I can find out some more information around that. Tell you right, it's not a horrible place to go visit. They won't be able to make the decision that quickly, um, as so it wouldn't be the tell you right one. Okay. Well, I'll, whenever. I'll, I'll talk to them and see when uh, uh, when that is, and I'll bring it back mm -hmm. to you guys. Okay. But I'd only suggest that we probably do want to have our comments prepared for the Telluride meeting to get this in front of CPW Absolutely. if there's only one meeting a year. And the comment that I am very enthusiastic to see embraced is a comment that would much more strictly enforce closure <clears throat> when some designation of fire hazard has been pronounced. The notion that Ken and Scott will simply talk isn't conclusive enough. If it's stage one, something should happen. If it's stage two, something more dramatic should happen. And I realize this is a state level issue that'll probably go up to DNR, but we need to start raising the issue somewhere. And so starting with CPW is probably the place to, Great. to push it forward. Yeah, well, that's great. It's the CPW on the Wildlife Commission, I think they meet almost monthly. <clears throat> so it could be August, it could be September. But I agreed with the fact that we want to get comments into the Wildlife Commission mm -hmm. just to have them be aware of it and I I personally agree with Auden on the fact that you know an indoor shooting range is not a bad option it's and not it would be you know it, it would create an incredible resource for shooting and it would actually then I wouldn't mind seeing the increase in the amount of use mm -hmm. because then it's a contained facility and stuff like that but i also worry about how many people we're bringing up there because it's not you know it goes through kind of where the wilds go through and so don't necessarily want to see an increase in traffic too mm -hmm. and also the one other thing i want to say is when we put our letter together with comments on it i mean this was not noticed this conversation because it came up as comments not on the agenda or council so Nobody had an opportunity to come and weigh in on this subject. Mm -hmm. So if we could have this same conversation again, only have it as an agenda item, a placeholder, so people know that we're talking about this, it would be more fair. Yep. Okay. Um, so are we ready for? Manager's report? Oh, geez, are we just not getting to that? <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I don't know if you've been reporting all along. I know. Okay. I've got I've got a long manager's report okay. too. So. But is everybody done? Okay. So I'm going to try to get through these without fumbling too much. Should but, we set the timer? Um, oh yes. Now that you should. Um, okay. So I have a couple. Um, this is sort of the time of year um, where we get solicited, um, or you all get solicited to put your support behind things. Um, and we've had a couple of them come in. And my uh, general statement to you guys, and you probably saw it in emails recently, is while well, some things may seem like, oh gosh, yeah, that sounds like a great idea, I always like to check with um, 
uh, our resources with the CML just to see what um, what things were not being told about a certain um, initiative or if there are you know in the case uh, there was something came up recently about water so I talked I contacted our water attorney and chatted um, but um, these uh, letters um, where we've been uh, asked to uh, support um, I have vetted them uh, along those along the, the thread and so just want to get some uh, direction from you all on that um, so the first um, was a request to sign on to a letter um, where um, basically asking the BLM to provide two things. A, um, uh, a longer public comment period, and secondly, um, a rebuttal of their assessment um, that an analysis regarding the federal coal leasing program doesn't have any significant impacts, which, which mean environmental impacts in part. Um, apparently, back in 2016, um, there was a uh, decision for the Department of the Interior to do a review of the federal coal program and the leases associated with it um, and the environmental and fiscal impacts. Um, and uh, as a result, um, because they sort of predicted what some of the outcomes might be environmentally, um, they put a moratorium on any new um, leases. Well, fast forward to 2017, under um, the current administration, they terminated um, that moratorium. And um, they uh, did not disclose um, any of the, the um, coal programs, environmental or climate impacts as part of that. And so basically, um, when they came up, came out with the finding, they allowed for the public um, on an environmental assessment 15 days to comment, which normally, like if you remember when we had um, the, the comment period up the frying pan for the, the logging operation up there, that was something like 90 days or something along those lines. So it, it really gave us a chance to chew on it, bring it back to you know, councils and their schedules and whatnot. So basically this is um, trying to uh, challenge their 15 day comment period, ask for a longer comment period and to rebut the environmental assessment that was released saying that um, there was no significant findings. So if you so wish, um, I would um, uh, on your behalf submit uh, a support for um, this letter. So Questions or motion? <clears throat> Pardon me. Yes, sir. Jackie. <laughs> so there's one other piece to this, which is that over the years, uh, coal mines have, have uh, leased BLM land, government land, public land, to get the coal and to sell it. And that, um, those leases are at a very, very, very low rate. And so this is your coal. It's the people's coal. And part of this pause was to say, what's the right rate? What's it worth? And what are the economic costs, the externalities to it? So this is, you know, it's partly an environmental issue, but it's partly a justice and an equity and a, what is the people's resource worth? So I make a motion that we sign this uh, as, a, as a town. And did you have anything else you want to add to the letter based on what you're saying? It, it, you touch on that. It, it touches on that in there. Okay. I just wanted to make sure everyone understood that. Okay. So we have a motion. Is there a second? Second. Further discussion? I just have a question. Mm -hmm. You guys wrote it. Did you guys write it, or is this like a boilerplate almost? Boilerplate, yeah. Okay. Okay. But it looks like you've made some changes also. Or you That's just my speech. Oh, your <laughs> speech. Oh, yeah. sorry. Okay. <laughs> sorry. I didn't so mean, I don't to, fumble didn't mean to so call much. you on that. Yeah. Okay. So we have, we have a motion and a second. Are you okay with it as is? I am. It just, it's so lengthy describing to get to the point that, you know, a reader, like, it would be good to have, like, the punch up front. But if it's boilerplate, it's boilerplate. Well, but why don't we have a summary, executive summary at the first paragraph, just so you say what we want. We oppose, we oppose lifting this. That's a really good idea. And, and, uh, Longer comment period. Yep, I like that. So we have a motion and a second. Little changes in there. 
Um, anybody else? Or are we ready? All in favor? <coughs> Aye. 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 Opposed? Excellent. Thank you, Ryan. Sure. Okay, second one. So, um, Councilor Infante and forward, uh, had forwarded me, um, and I believe several of you probably received, um, a request from a nonprofit organization called uh, COPERG, and it's a, a, a Denver based. What's it, what does it stand for? Colorado Public Interest Group. Research. 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 Okay. So, um, basically, what, what um, they were asking is for council members to sign on individually. Um, to advocate for uh, continued expansion um, of the busting uh, service, and um, they went through and they talked about what you know busting had had done and their expansions. Um, Bill had asked a couple questions like, "Well, are we already um, you know paying for this through RAFTA?" Um, and it looks like it is a, a CDOT program, and then CDOT contracts with a private vendor to provide the service. <coughs> Um, there, um, as far as um, service out of the valley, you you know you take the the transit line from anywhere in the valley, and there's two locations in Glenwood Springs that you can pick it up and, and take it uh, uh, over to Denver, and it does go to um, Glenwood or to um, um, West Grand Junction. Grand Junction. Thank you. <laughs> Gosh, um, and so you can you can take it in that direction as well. Um, and then uh, something about the cost, and I think, you know, I looked it up, I think it was about $42 if, if you were taking it over to, to Denver from, um, from Glenwood. So uh, basically, I did contact um, one, of the, one of the red flags that always goes up for me when people are, are asking for support. Support doesn't come for free. And so um, I called CML just to ask about, you know, what, what do you know about um, the group and, and busting and the source of money they might be asking for. Um, and because I'm always worried, usually municipalities get on the chopping block first. Um, and uh, it, he didn't seem to think that it was an issue. And in fact, um, with the new governor, the, the new CDOT director is going around um, the state on a listening tour right now. And one of um, her uh, initiatives is al alternative transportation and really trying to expand that and try to find solutions. And so um, it looks like um, this one, I also, by the way, called RAFTA and had a conversation with Dan. He reviewed it and didn't know no red flags went up for him either. So, um, so basically, this is more of a, um, you know, I think I could probably respond to them as the entire on behalf of the entire council, or if you all would like to do it individually, that's also fine, but um, just thought yeah. I'd bring it to everybody for you sure. to chew on a little. Um, I would support this. Bustang, I know a lot of people who use it, and so I'd be happy for council to, or to direct Ryan to have council write an overall thing. The more cars you can take off the road and the more opportunities you have to get to Denver. Yeah, I, I have used Bustang, and I think one of the things that's it's not wrong with Bustang it's just like they should have done some expansions by now because it's still what it was on day one which is you can get on the bus in Glenwood Springs at 8 o'clock let's say and you can come back and be back home at 9 or 11 at night and that's your only choices mm -hmm. so it's it's not as usable as it could be you know it's been a long time since CDOT was the Department of Transportation or of Highways. It's supposed to be transportation. Let's ramp it up so people can use it for God's sake. Well, why don't we just add, add to it and just say we'd like we'd to support Bustang but also to expand Bustang. Yeah. And, and I think that was so. And if you all want me to try to do that, that's great. It, it did seem like. Um, it might have signing said on they just wanted to add your name to their form letter once again um, but I could always add a little note to um, to Margot the, the woman that, that um, represents them and, and advocate for more expansion and, mm -hmm. and I think that's sort of what their what their whole point is is sure. is to try to increase the options any other discussion or motion I'll make a motion that um, council sign on to the letter for support of Bustang. Second. Great. Further discussion, all in favor? Aye. 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 Great. 
Okay. okay. And then the third letter, and then I'm done with the letter <laughs> part. Um, so I received a letter just yesterday from RAFTA, from uh, David Johnson, um, and they're <clears throat> looking for uh, the mayor to sign a support letter um, for a grant they're uh, chasing down. So it's a build grant program, and build stands for better utilizing investments to leverage development. <clears throat> it's a federal grant program, I believe. And basically what they'd use the money for is to renovate the um, maintenance facility down in Glenwood. Um, the current maintenance facility is built in 2002, meant to house 30 buses. Um, today they have about 45 buses. Um, they're trying to bring it up to a capacity of, of 60 buses. And with the, with the buses, apparently over time they've become um, sort of more sophisticated. They're bringing on the electric buses so they have more equipment needs as well associated with it. They have about $15 million now to go toward it. They were um, depending on or, or would have used um, additional funding that would have come through the Destination 2040 plan that failed um, at the ballot last, um, last fall. That was uh, 7A. Um, so they've gone back to the drawing board and they've asked for money from um, the Federal Transit Administration before, um, but uh, they were asking for larger sums, $22 million. So they, they asked for some feedback. Why, you know, why aren't we getting the grant? And the feedback was, well, ask for a lesser amount. Um, so they're asking for eight million, and um, and then also get letters of support from you know your regional partners. So that's part of what they're doing. Susan, um, are you trying to speak? No, I just meant that. I think you said that twenty, the destination twenty forty failed. You really meant the state ballot language failed on the seven A. That's the ballot language that. that yes. Failed. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for that. I mean, just, this is just a consent <clears throat> item. Normally. Yeah, but I just got it yesterday. It was too late well, to put it on, so I, I oh, just so want to know. They need it now. They need it now. And if you guys um, uh They're not asking us for money. Support. They're just nope. asking us they for support. they just want support. Anybody have questions or a motion? I make a motion that we support RAFTA. This, this thing. And this item. <laughs> so Second. we'll have that for you to sign there. Okay. okay. All in favor? Uh, aye. 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 Opposed? I'm sorry. Was there a second? I'll second it. I second it. Thank you, Ryan. I knew I heard it. Oh, I didn't hear it. Um, and then just um, two more updates, because um, I know we're getting on in time. But um, Sunday Market, uh, that starts this Sunday for the first one um, of the year. So come out and join that. Um, and then also Saturday is the reseeding project um, that uh, Roaring Fork Outdoor, Outdoor Volunteers um, is putting on. And so, gosh, last I talked to Kathy, last week there was something like 200 volunteers so there's probably more now one of the um, interesting um, things to note is as part of the watershed protection um, program that we're um, <coughs> we are um, uh, doing um, for mudslides uh, this project we have figured out a way for it to count toward in kind and so that helps reduce the overall uh, burden for what would normally be placed on the local um, residents. And so uh, the more people we get, it's like $14 an hour per volunteer that we get to count toward it. So pretty slick deal. Um, and so, um, so that's Saturday. And then lastly, um, you know, Greg mentioned we've had the, the mud and flood. We've had a couple meetings uh, just in the last few weeks. And um, one of the final things, you know, it's, it's, it's all well and good that we're, we're uh, trying to mitigate and put in the berms and things like that to protect people's homes. Um, but the um, warning system is one of the most important things. And um, we are working with uh, Eagle County. They've taken the lead on this piece, but um, to get um, rain gauges placed up on Basalt Mountain. Apparently the weather patterns on Basalt Mountain, um, if you go from the north to the south, are completely and totally different. Um, in the mountain regions also, there's, um, f um, it's di the radar, it's difficult to kind of pick up accurately um, what the weather is doing. And so these rain gauges um, that will be monitored um, by the USGS, um, uh, uh, they'll come in and install them, they'll monitor them um, and uh, basically they'll be able to tell uh, and inform people it'll go out on pick and alerts if there's an issue you know likely for chance of a, of a flood um, and uh, so it looks like 
um, the there was a eighteen thousand dollar delta that um, needed to be made up to be able to get these. The fire um, uh, department or the fire district committed to taking half of that, and um, this was sort of last night. And I said, yeah, whatever. We'll we'll pay for the nine thousand. We'll find it. Um, a couple possible sources um, for that is a kind of going around passing the hat to the other counties, Garfield, um, Pitt, and County will both benefit from this as well. Um, but just as far as getting the project moving, um, you know, I, I was willing to say, yeah, let's pay $9,000. So just wanted to let you guys know in case you hear about that. Um, and we want to get that up before monsoon. So that's the hurry is to get it up there on by July. So that's it. Wow. Nothing more? That's it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. Thank you. That was all pretty interesting stuff. Okay, now we're going to have a real council meeting here. All right. Yes. And our first item is leash laws off leash areas. Um, and who's got so that? So Greg, Greg and I are going to sort of got tag it. team on this. I'll maybe introduce it, and then Greg's been um, dealing with it for longer than I because. Um, he has a, uh, a memo dating back a couple of years that was included in your packet. Um, so the town of Basalt right now has a, um, has a, a leash law and um, it is um, just not strictly enforced. And um, basically if I've uh, seen one thing in the small Colorado communities I've worked in, um, it's that each and every community kind of struggles with how do you, how do you enforce it? Because um, in Colorado, people love their dogs. And, um, and so uh, that's what we're attempting to do. I think we've just reached a point where we're getting enough feedback and concern about um, dog bites, uh, whether it be dog on dog or, or dog on person, um, that we thought we'd, we'd bring it back to the council. Um, we, of course, didn't bring a blank sheet of paper um, with us. We had a suggestion um, for council to consider. And um, um, this was actually not in your, um, in your packet, uh, but Susan uh, did point out to me um, that the post master plan, it does align with um, what we are suggesting. And so um, essentially, we, we don't think that Creating a bunch of fenced dog parks is a is a great idea. It's expensive. They tend to get um, uh, you know pretty confined, and um, instead, what we were thinking is that we would have a general um, uh, leash law that we would enforce in uh, throughout town, and we would designate a few places where uh, people could run their dogs off leash. Essentially, they'd be under um, voice command as good as that, um, is, but there, there are places now that people um, um, are uh, running their dogs. So we have Arbany Park is a place where people gather in the morning and evening on the big field there and run their dogs. Um, the Southside Park uh, is another one of those. And then there's a section of, of Linear Park, um, sort of on the north end of Linear Park, closer towards Willits Town Center. Um, that kind of has a long um, uh, stretch of grass um, where dogs could run. Uh, and there's a road that then separates them from the area where the, 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 um, the play structure is and where you have a lot of kids running around and such. So, um, you know, a, a chief had thrown out a couple ideas of how um, he um, dealt with this in the past as, sort of, as far as education and, you know, buying you know, a number, like buying a bunch of leashes and, you know, passing them out to people and really kind of taking a, a community policing uh, standpoint just to educate folks for a time um, and, uh, and talk about it and then <clears throat> eventually um, in the short term start to be, um, to, to enforce it more strictly. So, um, Chief, you want to talk a little bit about your, your memos and, and... Sure, so the memos, <clears throat> excuse me, date back to 2012 and it's just numbers. Numbers of dog at large calls, numbers of dog bites with dogs being on leash or off leash and biting, and then if it was dog on dog attack versus dog on person attack. So since January 1, 2012, and I updated these numbers to yesterday, so there's not a third memo. This has been going on since 2016, this conversation on the first memo. Um, so bites off leash, 68, on leash, 18. Of those, 
there was 46 dog on dog attacks and 40 dog on person attacks. And over that time period, 120, 1,028 dog at large calls for service that have come into our, our office. So it's, it's a balancing act of dogs need to have places to run. They need to you know, be able to exercise. People want, it, want that. But then the other side of it is pedestrians, families with younger kids, people who are afraid of dogs or dogs that they or people that have been bit previously. They want the dog on a leash in areas where they frequent too. So it's kind of that balance. And I think with, with conversations with Ryan and with planning of looking at areas where it's, it's a off leash area without fences, just a couple signs that say you can run your dogs off leash here. But once you leave that, we need you to have them on a leash to help, you know, curtail dog bites or, or dogs at large. Um, I think it's a, it's a good balance. No one's, wanting to do total strict 100% enforcement where a dog has to be on the leash at all times. So I think this is a good compromise of how we can try and address the issues and the concerns that we're hearing from community members. So can I ask a quick question? So is, okay, this is, this thing we've got in front of us is the original or the ordinance we have in place right now? Oh yes, yes, so I that include is. the ordinance okay. okay, so and so how would language be in, Included in here. I, I don't think we're changing the ordinance, mm -hmm. or we're not looking oh, to do we're that. Not we're change. looking to to just provide areas that dogs could be off leash, and I think that could be an administrative action or direction from council, um, while still enforcing the 10-foot leash law in all other areas of town. Okay, but does it say in the ordinance there are places where this doesn't apply, where the ordinance doesn't apply? And it doesn't. I, I don't think it does. I think if there is a if a code amendment is needed, it would be to provide the authority to designate places that could be off leash areas. So I can review that with the chief, and if there needs. I mean, to be a code I would like something would. to yeah. say. We have a minor change here, or sure. something, you know, because otherwise, this is the code. Right. Yeah. We just did this in Pickens County, and you do have to revise. Right. Yeah, we need to revise it, and then you have to, um, you know, create the areas where you could put your dogs off leash. Even though if you designate, council can declare them, they still have to vote to declare it. I mean, we still have to actually formally right. declare them. Yeah. So, so we'll review the code amendment okay. and ensure that the proper authorities in place to kind of enact what it is that council sure. wishes in terms of no leash areas. Yeah. That's good. The timing's perfect that you just did this. Um, anybody? Yeah. I have a question. Since we're now moving towards a world in which we're going to start enforcing our leash law and we need to get that out to our community, can we create some signage that's maybe at the doggy pots that say, you know, we have a leash law and we are enforcing it and, and let people know that this is a thing and they will be... Um, so, excellent excellent idea. It is a good idea. Not just yet. We, we can do those signs, but not till 2020. <laughs> <laughs> that was so efficient of you. Because we, we have to order them, you know, and we then should they'll have be in the budget years ago when we didn't know them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. How's, yes. Uh, there's, I feel, one other location that dog people frequent, and that is the Basalt River Park. There are a lot of people that work at Ski Co. Ski Co is a dog-friendly workplace. The, they go out and they run and play fetch over there um, from the area RMI. Um, and I also see um, there's not a playground there. It seems like a, a safer, less dog <coughs> children. The only the only comment I would I would have to that is today that's true mm -hmm. um, as we develop the park that might change so in the code if we're de designating specific places um, we might think about that but in the code if we're being a little more vague and are able to administratively um, do you know designate places then that then that um, might work but you know today it, you're right or, or maybe in the language you could say these places and or places that are posted okay or something sure. so it, no. you can Wait, so you can be specific like gary saying because i think you gonna mm -hmm. have to be somewhat specific in a code amendment but then but say something about posting mm -hmm. it's yeah there's two different things yeah right so i mean one it's um 
we'll look at whether or not and to what extent the specific places need to be identified and then also the part of creating the authority to um, to then designate what areas can be off-leash areas. Okay. Well, anyway, you've got this stuff covered. It's your job. Yeah. I have a question for Gary on the Pitkin County open space um, defining um, a dog, the dog-free areas like Jaffe Park, and what is the definition of voice command, and what are the what what are the slaps on the wrist to fines? It's specifically listed out in our. Um, regulations what voice and sight control is okay and so if we're going to go that way I would say you know we should have some type of voice and sight control because you know that that helps you if the dog completely <coughs> out of control even in an off-leash area you'll have some authority to say well that's not another voice or sight control so at least you can deal with it in that um, way shape or form maybe the county we could get the look at the counties since they just did it it's well i looked at the the code in basalt is different right than the county's code but basically you would just be adding something to the basalt code right. to give the council authority to declare places off leash if they choose to do so right and then we'd want um a different thing to say you know that we declare Arbany Park. You might do that by resolution then, or something right. like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. You honestly don't want it in the code. Yeah. No, no. You have I to like change the, the code. You have yeah. to change. To, you to have to change authority. this municipal code <laughs> but to allow specific. it. But you don't need to do it. You just need to. Well, we need to define it, so it can be by resolution most likely. Right. But you have to make sure it is because. You, you're, he needs to know that like these are the areas where you can and cannot do that. Right. So, anyway. You know, could we stop here in the middle? There is a woman that wants to make a, a comment regarding this. Come on up if you want to make a comment. <clears throat> we are fairly strongly at this. My name is Ellen Weinstein. I live in Willits, and I'm speaking as a dog person, not anti-dog. So. Dog leash laws exist for a reason. They help maintain a safe and respectful environment for dogs and people, including but not limited to children who are afraid, elderly with mobility and balance issues, people with disabilities, and dogs on leashes who do not like being charged by other dogs. I'm not sure why the police have been instruct instructed not to enforce the leash laws. I don't think council would have them not enforce stop signs or speed limits. Enforcement of, quote, nuisance laws, such as leash laws, actually tends to make better relations among members of the community. A large number of professional dog-related organizations, publications, and owner groups state the importance of leashes when do a dog is off its own property, no matter how well trained. As a resident of Willits and a taxpayer, and having a dog that is not unfriendly but does not like having loose dogs run up to her and get in her face, I would like to be able to walk in the neighborhood or the park without having to continually be on the defensive against off-leash dogs. It's not enjoyable, to say the least, to walk continually, worrying about fending off other dogs, potentially having to break up a dog fight, or lose my balance or slip on ice in the winter. I don't want any person or dog getting hurt. When I, I live across from the park, and when I've been out, I've witnessed numerous potentially tragic interactions. Your statistics may be underestimated because some incidents don't get reported. I myself have taken one dog to the emergency center with a ripped ear from an attack by an off-leash dog, another that got hit by a car running across Valley Road. That could also potentially cause a car accident and injury to people involved. My neighbors have young children. The, daughter, the young daughter is six years old. She's afraid of dogs. One ran up to her, and the owner actually yelled at the daughter for running from the dog. Um, and the mother, when she told him to leash his dog, he said she, she was totally ignored. 
She also tells me the people in our brand new expensive playground are so busy watching their kids, they don't pay attention to the off-leash dogs that pee on the playground equipment or poop off to the sides. And it's now the whole park is being used as a dog park. People just drive up, they get out of their cars, the dogs are off leash, they run into the valley and even into the road, they have their frisbees and tennis balls, and obviously are there with the express purpose of playing with the dogs. A leash dog having an unleashed dog rushing up to it unwanted it can be a stressful event to the dog, can set back training and socialization. People often, yes, the people who call their dog, they go, it's fine, it's not fine. Um, often the dog doesn't listen, and no matter how well trained a dog is, it's still a dog. No dog has 100% recall, nor can the owner predict 100% of the time how the dog will react in a grieving. One more minute. <laughs> in summary, I would That's note that dogs off leash and on leash areas have potential to have a significant effect on others. A leash loss exists for safety and keeping the peace, preventing car accidents, bike and skateboard accidents, getting injured by pe people getting injured by dogs, dog bites, dog fights, dogs being hit by a car or hurt. So I know this may be unpopular, but I respectfully request the police officers not be prevented from enforcing the leash law. I believe a few warnings and maybe a few tickets, people will get the message. They will learn there is a sign that says leash law is strictly enforced. They'll learn that it's not a joke. And I don't object at all to areas that are safe and appropriate for those who desire to have their dogs off leash. But everywhere is not that place. Thank you very Thank much. You. Well spoken. Okay. Um, okay, so um, is the suggestion that we noodle this and bring it back? Yeah, we'll bring it bring it back. I think we have enough direction unless there's any more comments. I just have a question. Uh, what is the consequence? I'm sorry. What's the consequence when a human is caught without their dog on a leash so it's in the it's in the fine schedule it's, in the yeah. code. Oh, I just didn't see the it, fine it's probably i think it's uh, i'm going to say it and then i'll keep looking but i think it's no, our it's normal one of oh, pardon me it's, it's in a separate fee schedule no i know but it's up to twenty five hundred dollars um 26 80 20 26 yeah. okay so it actually has wow. a stick uh-huh nice yeah. i mean usually people don't I get like fine sticks. it allows the judge you know the judge makes that determination mm -hmm. uh, depending but if somebody got four dog tickets then he might get a little more serious with the fines so okay so um did you have something Jeff? i was just going to clarify that the for if you have your dog off leash and a dog yeah. running a large ticket a and, $2, ticket. <laughs> and you get a ticket it's yeah, going to be it's going to be a begin at a relatively uh, relatively low yeah. fine amount and it's set out in the fine schedule that has, has been adopted and then that es can escalate if there's repeat occurrences if there are so many repeat occurrences rather than there be a fine written on the ticket it'll be written as a summons into the into court where there that is then more discretion with of the uh, prosecutor and the judge in entering what that fine amount would be any more questions or can we get a motion do we need a motion i just like to make an observation that we have a human playing fetch with her dog right outside this meeting right here write her a ticket <laughs> <laughs> and um just thinking about the locations, um, I think that there, the ratio <clears throat> of amount of space per um, neighborhood, and I have a little bit of concern in Willits um, that that one section um, of Linear Park is where dogs can go off leash. Um, looking at, there's a, a lot of people that live in the townhomes that we own, that the town owns a couple of, and they frequent the, um, the rugby field. Rugby field's huge. Maybe that's another opportunity place. Um, just want to put it out there. Yeah. Of I think the one reason we kept them off of the mm -hmm. rugby field, and somebody might know the history better than me, is just that we have people there and dogs poop all, you yeah, know? Yeah, there's a sign so, there that cool. says, don't do this because there are children and people don't pick up. Uh, um, which is another thing. Yeah. Um, 
Is there in in our code something about when dogs aren't cleaned up after and that punishment? Because that's sure. like yes. the, DNA testing. What? You can do DNA testing. Right. But I'm just <laughs> saying because that's what I experience. The issue is, is when we when we see something like that and we stop and look at them, they pick it up. Yeah. yeah but so it's when we're it not there. Exactly. So that's that's that balance and the responsible ownership is what that comes back to. But we do tell people, you need to pick them up. We place those those bag stations all over the place. So you'd be amazed at how you know hard it is to get a poop ticket because as soon as the ranger shows up, that person's picking up the poop. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think we've issued about four poop tickets in over 15 years. <laughs> Because okay, as soon as can we move on? There, <laughs> <laughs> I would I would wonder if there could be a motion to draft an amendment to the leash law to address locations for dogs to be off leash. Do we need a motion? Can we just do let's have a motion so we have a direction? Somebody. A motion for what you just said. Okay. Second. <laughs> uh, further discussion. Uh, just one one item. Uh, Jen's comment about you know the different areas. I think this is like uh, a starting point. You know, mm -hmm. so I think I think it allows us to come up, and you know, I think there's there's um, uh, a lot of people that are that I see walking their dogs on the leash, so they may or may not you know choose to to use that. Um, but I do want to be a little cautious for you know we just um, heard from a citizen that as their as their um, you know if there's predictability as to where the dogs can be off leash, it allows those folks who who don't want to be around those dogs to avoid that area right, exactly. um, and so you know i think you know it's kind of i see it as baby steps at, mm -hmm. at first and you know whatever direction we ultimately get from you guys but that's just sort of my answer to sure. your comment so we have a motion and a second uh any any further discussion all in favor aye, aye. 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 opposed all right thank you that could have been worse it was worse <laughs> <laughs> Oh, sorry. I think you're funny, Auden. <laughs> what can I say? Okay. Um, I Auden is the one person here without a dog. And Ryan. I had one. Ryan had one. Yeah. He killed it. I did. Oh. <laughs> no, he didn't. He didn't. Okay. <laughs> so I guess some things can't be joked about. Um, the next item is something about the census, the 2020 census presentation. So just really quickly, and I think Watkins will uh, uh, do a presentation. We're going to have a, a slightly abbreviated presentation. Is that correct? Um, even, we, even the newspaper's leaving, so you know it's going to oh, get bad. Geez. <laughs> um, <laughs> couldn't leave fast enough. <laughs> He's <laughs> running. <laughs> yeah. He's sprinting. We did try to get somebody um, from the census, and they were um, they were unable to make it tonight. So we'll, we'll reschedule that um, as um, as time allows so uh in lieu of that though i was going to talk yet really... another hat and another award <laughs> <laughs> well don't compliment too soon um but to talk brief briefly about the census um some things that you already know i'm sure um i thought i'd talk first about what the census is uh it's a mandated function of the federal government mandated by the constitution every 10 years we have to count every person living in the country uh, so that's every person, regardless of age, regardless of citizenship, regardless of how long you've lived in a particular place. So uh, quite an undertaking, obviously. And by most accounts, the Census Bureau and the, the Census 2020 is, is underfunded. Um, and so that's why there's been such a push to get involvement at the local level, which I'm going to talk about here in a second. Why is the Census important? For reasons you already know, uh, we want to ensure equal representation in Congress, and we want to have the opportunity to have access to uh, our fair share of, of federal funding for uh, numerous programs, you know, including infrastructure here. So what are we doing here in the Roaring Fork Valley? Um, we're working with our neighboring jurisdictions, especially Pitkin County and Aspen, who have um, taken a lead in, in putting together what's called a complete count committee, uh, or CCC. This is something that most jurisdictions do around the country, and the Census Bureau uh, encourages it and offers support in every way that they can. <coughs> Uh, so this is going to be a, a Roaring Fork Valley-wide CCC. Um, 
there's also one in the Eagle Valley, and I'm staying in touch with them through email. Um, we haven't attended any meetings, and we're not planning to at this point, uh, but we are staying in contact. And so what the CCC is doing is identifying hard-to-count populations. That's the bulk of the effort um, in the census is, is trying to find these people who wouldn't ordinarily respond for, for various reasons, people who don't speak English very well, seasonal workers, migrant workers, uh, very young people, babies can't fill out forms, they need someone to do it for them. Um, and so we've, we've started making this list of people and in order to encourage the participation of these hard to count populations, uh, we're relying on what we're calling trusted messengers. So we're reaching out, trying to identify companies um, that employ a lot of people, anyone really who's you know, a voice of influence and, and is active in the community. And so this is an opportunity for you all as council as well to, to give input on this, I think. Um, we're making a kind of a, a list, a spreadsheet, and we're hoping to have a big meeting in July, um, a date that hasn't been determined yet, to bring all these potential partners together and so that we can kind of give them information, answer questions proactively on behalf of, of these hard to reach people. Um, and so the role of the CCC is really to just provide information to help people participate in the census. That's the goal of this. Um, the Census Bureau, although they're not here tonight, I think they would, they would like it if we could put uh, a link on our website about uh, census jobs. They have numerous job opportunities that you know, people going door to door, community organizing and all that. Um, to put that on our website to advertise for that, I think they'd appreciate that. Um, and I don't have anything else for you all, but I'm happy to take questions. And if it's a question I can't answer, I can track it down for you guys. So have you talked to the person <clears throat> or type of person who might come present? And yes. Is, so that's still a plan, a broader PowerPoint? Yes, ma'am. Or something like that? Yeah. And it, you know, it, maybe you could let me know how much detail and any particular topics you would all would like to, to hear about. One of the things that um, Susan and I brainstormed about a little bit with regard to the timing, you know, um, we wanted to just kind of kick it off with um, just some basic information so you all knew it was coming, um, but maybe bring a person back as it's becoming more, you know, closer to census yeah, time so that it's, um, you know, people are, you know, timely and, and like right. it's, it's time to start, you know, giving, you know, your information, filling out, you know, whatever, just so that we can start building the, right. the interest. And uh, census uh, time, I don't think I mentioned this, census day is April 1st, 2020. Great. Oh, so let's not start talking about it every day, okay? <laughs> <laughs> it's 10 months away. <laughs> It'll be here before you know it. Yeah. And many of you guys actually met Mark, who was <clears throat> at the um, open house yeah. for the master plan, and he was really excited to be there. And um, it just didn't work out. He was out. so excited. Yeah, he was so excited. He was excited to make a presentation to you guys, and somehow it didn't work uh, for tonight. But April 2020, guess what else happens then? Election. Um, Town of Assault election. We'll be gone. Mm -hmm. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Good job. Yes, the, the only addendum, there was a presentation at the last Northwest COG uh, meeting, and there is a very, very significant grassroots mobilization effort. But the, the point that they were pressing for us in Colorado is the importance for Colorado in this sentence, because the belief is we have grown faster than other states, and we could very comfortably pick up a congressional seat, right. and the congressional seat will likely see a division of District 3, which means we won't have this colossal district. Um, it will be divided and probably better represent us, I think. That would be nice. So I think that's he, I think the guy that was at the... Um, the other night at Rocky Mountain Institute, I think he was saying that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, thanks. Okay, thank you. Unless anybody has questions. Can we All right. Put the on our website. <coughs> Is that okay? Why not? Sure. Yeah. Uh, normally, we talked about this. Normally, we don't put post people's jobs on there. Oh. Um, but uh, Pam and I were talking through it, and and because this is a. a a bit different, you know, it, it, it's, you know, for the public good in the sense of, of representation and it's a, essentially a fellow government. Um, we felt comfortable, but we did want to just make sure you guys had that same level of comfort. Yeah. Because you know. normally it's just nonprofits and the local agencies that we post. We're happy to, I'm happy Does anybody to have a problem with it? Okay, great. Thanks. Okay. Right. Okay.
Finally, public hearing and second reading of Ordinance 12, an ordinance of the town, establishing the Basalt Green Team as a formal advisory board to the town council. Susan. This is a public hearing in the second reading. Uh, I went into more detail at the first meeting. This is just the formalization of the green team. And the intent is that the bylaws for um, the, the three organizations match as closely as possible uh, to each other. And so on that note, I'm going to point out that the second sentence <laughs> on your Exhibit A under member guidelines should read, green team members shall not present themselves as a representative of the town in any matter, private or public. And that was the language that we had uh, incorporated for the finance for all committee. So um, I'd like you to just, to, after the public hearing, approve it on second reading with as amended, uh, as amended or whatever. OK. Um, this is a public hearing. We'll open the public hearing now, 7.33. Anybody in the public have a comment regarding this? Close the public hearing. Council, questions, Mayor, comments? Mayor, I move the town council approve ordinance number 12, sir, 2019 on second reading. Sir, second. Second. All in favor? Uh, Aye. Aye. Opposed? Dismissed, <laughs> adjourned. Thank you, everybody.